Um, I'm trying to think that maybe this one and one or two more and we're done. And then I can retire. <laughs> you guys can figure out what you're going to do, see? Hallelujah. God of the covenants. This thing sounds a little loud. Is it a little loud for you guys? No? Okay. That's fine. God of the covenants. God of the covenant-making God and a keeping God. Hallelujah. So we ended last time with Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. We were talking about that passage of scripture where, you know, they brought her to Jesus, threw her on the ground in front of her and said, this woman was called, caught in adultery. The law says she needs to be stoned. What do you say? And of course, they were trying to trap him uh, into breaking the law. They were not happy with all of his love and compassion and mercy that he was showing people. And so they're trying to trap Jesus, okay? And so the story goes that he's writing in the sand, and he stands up and he looks at them and says, all right, those of you that are without sin, cast the first stone. And scripture says one by one, actually the oldest to the youngest, they walked away. And, and said, you know, um, to the woman, where are your condemners? And she said, they're gone. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more or go and leave this lifestyle that you've been. And, and of course, mercy is not the basis of the law. The law is a very strict, hard and harsh set of rules that either you're blessed by or cursed by. And that's the way God established them. And so we find here that Jesus is now starting to show us the Father, what the Father really desires. Okay? The law was not his desire. It was the people's desire. They said, you tell us what to do and we'll do it. And one of the things I thought about is that in our lives, sometimes maybe we need to kind of understand that whole thing that Jesus said, you know, those of you that are without sin cast a first stone. You know, as, as we start to think about that, what it should do is, is make us understand that we also need to extend that mercy to people, yeah. you know. That, that you and I don't live perfect. Now, we're perfectly saved, but we don't live perfect. And, and, and if you and I are going to show the Father to a lost and dying world or to a hurting person, mercy is what is going to show them that. Because mercy is somebody not getting what they deserve. And I'm telling you, sinners... And people that are hurting know the condition they're in. They don't need to be reminded of their sin and brokenness. They need to be reminded that there's nothing too dirty that God can't clean. And that's the good news of the gospel. That's what you and I are to bring to the people. That's the meal that we serve is the good news. Um, and so we could probably learn a lesson and let mercy reign in our lives. And you know what? Sometimes we have to be merciful to ourselves. Sometimes we're the hardest on ourselves, and that really doesn't help us any. We need to run to the throne of grace and find help in our time of need, not to uh, a place where we just get down on ourselves. We don't, that's not any benefit to us either. Um, so we find that Jesus is starting to reveal... Um, the new covenant to come. And in him, sin would be removed and grace and mercy would replace guilt, shame, and condemnation. See, that's a new thing for these people. If you, if you put yourself in that time of history, if you were a Jewish person, the law was the basis, it was the plumb line that you had to build your life upon. And your life was either blessed by it or cursed by it, and that's just how it worked. Um, 
And, and we understand that we talked about communion, that God now was making a way of escape. Jesus was starting to reveal to them that there's a way out from underneath this weight. And it's called mercy, the mercy of God. And, and so we find, you know, it, John 3.17, the scripture we don't hear a lot about, but we should add it to John 3.16. For Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. See, that makes people think differently because they think that Jesus came on a condemnation mission to show us our sin. No, Jesus came to remove that sin. Yes. Jesus came to take that sin away from us. He came to unshackle us from that which bound us, and that which bound us was the law. Understand that for so many years in history, the people lived under grace. But once the law came, the law is what finds you guilty. It's like anything, whether it's an earthly law or a spiritual law, it's what finds you either innocent or guilty. And once the law came, all mankind was found guilty because no one was able to keep the law. And so that's why when they brought this woman to her, they, it was rightfully so. She was caught in the act of adultery, and according to the law, she should have been stoned. That's just how it worked. But Jesus now coming to reveal the true heart of the Father showed mercy to this woman. And um, so this woman was given the gift of no condemnation. And, of course, you and I have been given that same gift in Romans 8.1, for there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Because the law has been taken off of you and I, and now the law of love, the perfect law of liberty, is what we now live underneath. Amen? Um, and so that really is what the basis of this new covenant was going to be established on, is the mercy of God. That the judgment of God would be removed and the mercy of God would be installed, that you and I now can function underneath that mercy. Uh, and the law is what finds us guilty, and the new covenant is what declares you and I innocent. So remember now, we're starting to transition in this window of history from the law, the law-based covenant, to this new covenant of grace and mercy. So we're starting to see Jesus reveal this. He's starting to bring it out now. And, of course, it took the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and threw them for, for a tailspin because they couldn't understand, well, God gave the law. What are we doing exiting that? And that's why they wanted to stone him. They wanted to throw him off a cliff. They wanted to get rid of this guy that was talking blasphemy. In fact, they even said that what he was teaching was of the devil. That's how frustrated they were by this teaching. But the people were loving it. Because they were starting to see maybe there's a way and maybe there's some hope for us. Because the law is not a place where hope is found. The law is what found you guilty. And, and so um, we find Jesus beginning to unveil this new covenant and the foundations of that that is going to be built upon. Uh, and how the new covenant is not an extension of the old covenant. We have to understand that that's something we have to get a hold of because there's some people that still believe today that Jesus came and fulfilled the old and then added to it with this new. It's like he, like he somehow dovetailed this new covenant to the end of the old covenant and now both of them are still intact. And that's why you hear people quite often say, well, we need the Ten Commandments in the schools, and we need the Ten Commandments here, and we need the Ten Commandments there, because they don't fully understand what the Ten Commandments were designed to do, what the law was designed to do. It was designed to show you that you do not live a life that God demands on your own. And the last thing you want to do is have this up in front of people now, Understand, if you're not going to be led by the Spirit, at a minimum, be led by the law. The law is perfect. The law is just. Scripture tells us that. The problem with the law was the flesh, was mankind. Yeah. And so if you're going to put the law up there, 
put John 3.16 up there with it. They realize that this is the standard and God came to set you free from it. You know? And so here's Jesus now. He's coming, but he's not extending onto the law. He's making it obsolete, Scripture tells us, that he's making it obsolete. Um, and one of the things you find out is when you try to function in that mindset where the law covenant and the grace covenant are somehow connected, it's a very toxic formula. Trust me, I know I tried to live underneath of it for about 15 years where I was trying to fulfill the law while walking in grace. And, and it's very confusing because you're not sure what God looks like in your life. Is he judging me by the law and my falling short of keeping the law? Or is he extending mercy to me and showing me grace? And so there's this very conflicting mindset that you have because you can't rest in the finished work of the cross because you always think that you're also being judged by the law. Thank God for grace and it alone. By grace are you saved and that not of yourself. Amen. Um, so the best part is Jesus himself made it very clear that the two don't mix. And, and I like the fact that Jesus did this because it seemed like for some reason we find more credence in what he says and what Paul said or what Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or Titus, or James said. If Jesus said it, it seems to carry a little bit more weight for whatever reason in our lives, okay? And, um, and you and I will also do well if we understand that truth that the law covenant and the new covenant or the grace covenant do not mix. They cannot coincide. One thing you understand is that the law produces self-righteousness because you get braggadocious about your keeping the law. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't stole from my neighbor. I haven't coveted. So look at me. Look how well I'm doing. Okay. So law and self-righteousness cannot coexist with grace. And, and the, the amazing part is, is that the reason the people that live under self-righteousness have such a problem with grace is because it takes the glory away from man and gives it to God. See, and that's why the Pharisees were having such a problem, because they wanted the glory for how well they were doing, how they were God's representative, and how they were the ones in the temple, and, and were God's people. And that's why they had such a fit with Jesus, because he was taking the glory off of them. He was taking the people's eyes off of them and putting them on to God. And they wanted to kill him and stone him and throw him off a cliff, and eventually they did it. And thank God it got done, because it's what you and I needed to get out from underneath the weight of the law. It's what made it obsolete for you and I. Um, so let's take a look at what I feel is some of the clearest teachings on this subject. The law covenant and grace covenant, or the old and the new, cannot and should not be mixed. I like it once again that Jesus comes and brings this himself to us as he prepares people for this new covenant. And it's like anything in our lives. When something new shows up, we always have this kind of stand back thought process for a minute because it's been going on this way for a lot of years. I'm sure that when the horseless carriage came out and had that little one cylinder motor on it, that all the horse people were going, What's going on here? That thing's moving without a horse. How's that happening? See, and all of us gasoline and diesel people are starting to go, what's with this electric stuff? I don't know if I like it. Because new stuff is just that way for us. And so here we have to understand, here's the Jews, and, and they're starting to be told something new that was contrary to the way they'd been living. And, and the interesting part is, is it's not like it was something new 
that man had, had produced and set forth. This is what God had brought forth in the law. And now Jesus is coming and saying, hey, listen, there's a new thing that's coming that's going to make that obsolete. And so let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 14 through 17. I'm going to read it out of the Amplified. Then the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus asking, Why do we and the Pharisees often fast as a religious exercise? So picture this now. So it's the disciples of John the Baptist. Okay, and they're coming to Jesus, and, but listen to what they say. Why do we, the disciples of John the Baptist, and the Pharisees often fast as a religious exercise, but your disciples do not fast? So remember, we talked about a lot of what happened in this time frame was not so much from the law, it was from the traditions that the Pharisees had set up. And a lot of what goes on in churches on Sunday mornings are not necessarily from God. They're from traditions of men that they have set up. And so they're questioning Jesus about this. He said, hey, listen, we in the Pharisees often fast, not because the law says to it, but because we've established this on our own, but your disciples do not fast. And Jesus replied to them, can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. But no one puts a piece of unshrunk new cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and, the, and a worse tear results. Nor is new wine put into old wineskins that have lost their elasticity. Otherwise, the wineskins burst, and the fermenting wine spills, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, so both are preserved. And it's interesting that they're calling out Jesus and his disciples for not doing this fasting thing. And so Jesus declares he is the bridegroom, and the disciples are his guests. And it was a time for them, the guests, to celebrate, not mourn. Because mourning is done during a time of, of, or fasting is done during a time of mourning. Usually when, when somebody would die or whatever, they would fast and they would mourn that. But Jesus is saying, hey, listen, the bridegroom is here and, and we're having this party and the guests is not time to mourn. When you're celebrating, it would be the wrong time to mourn. But the day is coming where the bridegroom is going to get taken away. And then suddenly, from their midst, because of the arrest and crucifixion, that there would be a time to mourn in that place. So Jesus is setting up this, this scenario that, hey, while I'm here, we're going to celebrate. But there's a day coming that I'm going to be taken away from the guests, and the, the guests will mourn at that point, all right? And... So the picture is now Jesus is no longer with them, okay? Jesus now has been, been crucified and died and now is taken away. He's no longer with them. Jesus has ascended into heaven, okay? So what he wants people to understand is um, that this new covenant in his blood has been ratified through his death, burial, and resurrection. So picture this now. Jesus was there. The bridegroom was there. He's been taken from them. He's no longer here on earth, and he's gone. And then Jesus goes on to tell them how the old and the new interact. Because of his blood, he told us at the Last Supper, the new covenant in my blood. If anybody asks you, when did the new covenant start? It didn't start at Matthew. It started when his blood was shed. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. It says in Leviticus uh, uh, 7.11 and Hebrews 9.22 both say that. And so now this new covenant has started. So Jesus is trying to prepare them for what this new and old look like and how they're going to interact. Because I say it's so important for us because we have to know, it's imperative that we know how the two operate. 
Because one of the things that happens a lot of times is people will come to a grace teacher or preacher and say, well, you guys just, just reject the law, and that's not true. We don't reject the law, but for a believer, the law has been put in its place, and the new covenant is in its place. And they say, well, you guys just don't, you guys just ignore sin. And we say, no, we don't ignore sin, we just exalt Jesus. Sin will kill you. Sin will still do what sin is, because built into sin are the wages. But why do you want to exalt sin when the remedy for sin has come? Why don't we talk about the remedy? And that's the person of Jesus Christ. So we don't reject any of that stuff. We just categorize it and put it in its right place. And, and we know from these teachings how one interacts with the other and how they're not supposed to be mixed. So he starts to talk about um, this new covenant. And here's the interesting part. So as we've been studying these covenants from the Garden of Eden all the way to the new covenant, there were many multiple covenants. We looked at the seven most prominent covenants. But isn't it interesting that the covenant that you and I are in right now, the new covenant, there's no prophecy of another covenant coming. This covenant is the last and final covenant. When you heard the words of Jesus, it is finished, not only was redemption done, but this new covenant started, and it's finished. This is the one that takes us to the marriage supper of the Lamb. There is no other covenant coming. So unlike all of the other people of God through history, there were covenant after covenant, we're in the final covenant. We're in the best covenant and the final covenant. Amen? And it's a grace covenant. And it's a um, royal grant covenant, which means that it's kept by one side. See, the law covenant was a, a Caesarean vassal, which means that both parties had to do their part in order for the covenant to function. But thank God this new covenant was made between the Father and the Son, and we're invited to enjoy into it, and join into it. We're adopted into the family. So there is no other covenant that's coming. God made this one, um, and so we see that it's so complete that no other covenant is needed. It's finished, and that all of mankind will be able to enter into it by faith. That's the other amazing thing about this new covenant is all of the other covenants were made with God's people. But this covenant now, all mankind is able to enter into this covenant. That's the other big difference. Jesus talked about the sheep of another pasture, saying, hey, I've got other sheep that I'm going to bring into this fold, and of course it was the Gentiles. Because prior to this covenant, the scripture says that you and I were in the world without hope. We didn't have a Savior coming as a Gentile, but we did. It was foretold, it just wasn't known. And so Jesus brought us all together then, and so now um, we have to understand that the new and the old are incompatible. And God designed it that way. God designed it that way. And the church should be a new and separate movement from Judaism. It doesn't mean that Judaism is discarded because we love the Jews. And there are some Jews that are Messianic Jews that have come to see that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. But there are a lot of them that aren't. It doesn't change. In fact, who's our greatest ally in the world? It's Israel. In fact, it's the only piece of land on the whole planet that God says to pray for. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? And so we have them, but those that still are functioning under the old covenant is a different covenant than the covenant that we're in. We're supposed to look different than that covenant because we operate by grace where they're still operating by the law. We should look different than them. And so we start to look at the cloth and the wineskins. 
make it clear Jesus was trying to show us that the two are incompatible, they don't mix, and don't try to mix them. And so remember this teaching by Jesus is all about the new interacting with the old and the outcome if you do mix them. See, that's what we have to see when Jesus is talking here. We'll read it again. It says, but no one puts a piece of unshrunk, which would be new cloth, on an old garment. So right away we see he's talking about new and old, new and old, new and old, new and old. Okay? Um, For the patch pulls away from the garment and a worse tear results. See, nobody would want to think that they're patching something if they knew that in the end it was going to be worse, that they were going to create something worse than what they started with. Nobody would want to do that. Um, and nor is the new wine put into old wineskins that have lost their elasticity, otherwise the wineskins burst and fermenting wine spills and the wineskins are ruined, but new wine is put into fresh wineskins, so both are preserved. See here, you, you notice that the, the basis of what he was saying here is preservation. That things are made better, okay? Um, and so the first one is, is trying to repair the old garment with a new cloth. Jesus is revealing to them that he was not concerned with patching the old religious system practiced by the Pharisees. That's what he's trying to convey to them is, hey, listen, I didn't come to patch this thing up. I'm not going to try and take this new thing and put it on the old. Because if we do, it's going to create a problem. It's going to be worse off than when we started. And and the reason that we know this is that he was establishing a new covenant even as he was working on fulfilling the old. Isn't that interesting? In the middle of all of this, he was fulfilling the old covenant on our behalf, but establishing this new covenant. And so we find out that day after day, religion tries to tell us we can patch ourselves and be made right with God by covering our sins by our own good works. And at that point, you're in worse condition than when you started, thinking you can save yourself. And and that's the amazing part. If we look at the true reality of what the old covenant was designed to do, in Galatians it tells us that it was designed to bring us to Christ because we realized that we could not keep it. And God designed it that way. That you and I can't keep the law. We can't be perfect as he demands perfection. And so trying to put this new covenant and intermix it with the old covenant, what happens is, is you, and this is where the Pharisees were at, they thought that their good works could create a righteousness that would be worthy of God. That they could do enough good things and become righteous in the eyes of God. And so what happens is when you water down the law, it makes you believe that you can get to the place of salvation by your own doing. And I remember trying to walk that out. I mean, I knew I was saved, but I thought that I had to uh, um, work out my salvation, Scripture says, with fear and trembling. So, of course, when you hear the word work, you're thinking doing stuff going out and sharing the gospel and, you know, praying for people at the hospital and doing jail ministry and and, and all good things. The problem was is that I was trying to mix the two and all I got was frustrated. You know, and you know my story of, of every day taking my good works and trying to ring the bell of success, believing that God was pleased with me today because of my good works and finally got wore out and threw the hammer down and said, I I can't ring the bell, God. I tried. I've done everything I know to do. Uh, I'm sorry. I can't measure up. And, and, And I came to the end of myself. And that's where I needed to get to. I needed to realize that I was trying to mix the old with the new, and all it brought was frustration. 
Because the funny part was that I got saved in prison, as most of you know, and I'm enjoying my salvation. And then I get out and I get involved in a church that what is what I call a grace plus church. You're saved by grace plus you're doing, whether it's tithing, reading the Bible, church attendance, all of these things, which the sad part is they're all good things. But they're not good if you're using them as a means to be accepted by God. If that's how you think that God is going to accept you is by your doing, then when is it, is it enough? When do you get to that finish line of I finally made it, I've done enough? And, and I tried to get there. I worked hard at it, and I couldn't get there. And so what happened was that in salvation that I was enjoying in prison, I tried to take this new garment and put it over the old garment, and I actually was in worse condition 15 years later than I was when I got out of prison. And that's what this scripture is trying to tell us, is that you and I in our humanity cannot take this brand new wonderful covenant that God made through the blood of Jesus Christ and add to it. We can't add anything to it. You know, and that's when you go back to Ephesians. You're saved by grace and not by works. Least any man should boast, but we're saved on two good works, which he's preordained for us to do. So works are in there. It's not like you get saved and you just get a kickback in your lazy boy recliner. But what happens now is you and I are being led by the Spirit of God to do what God wants to do rather than being led by the law of God. See, the law is very hard and harsh and judgmental, and it's very cold because it's just a checklist. And, and unfortunately, I found a lot of people that for whatever reason, they think it's going to be easier to live by the checklist than it is by the Spirit. Because if you think about a checklist, if there's 10 things that you've got on your list that you want to get done that day, and, and you get all of them checked off, you can feel pretty good about yourself. I went to the hospital and ministered. I read my two chapters in the Bible. I prayed for 20 minutes. I witnessed to a guy at the store. And you get the checklist done. You feel pretty good about yourself. But the problem is none of that stuff was spirit-led stuff. It was all stuff that the checklist had on it. And that's why God says, hey, listen, I want to leave that system, and I want to be the one that leads and guides you. And I may not want you to read three chapters in your Bible today because what I want you to do is go out and live those three chapters. I want you to be the hands and feet that you've read about that I am in scriptures. I want you to be out in the marketplace being that person for me. And, and you know, scripture clearly says that, hey, if we keep in step with the spirit, we won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. Keeping the law doesn't keep you from fulfilling the desires of the flesh. You just feel, and, and the other most devastating part about the law and the keeping of the law is if you've got your 10 things on your checklist and because of circumstances and situation and maybe even laziness, you only get five of them done, now at the end of the day, there's shame and there's guilt and there's condemnation, unworthiness, because you didn't get the checklist done. And so that's the problem with the law and the mixing of law and grace is you live on this roller coaster where you're feeling really good about yourself one day and then the next day you feel bad about yourself because you didn't do all these things on the checklist. And, and that's the dilemma that Jesus is trying to say here is, hey, listen, we're not, we can't take this new thing and add it to the old. At the end of the day, you're going to be in worse shape. If you'll just let the law be the law and bring you to Christ, come to Christ, and then the law is set aside. It's made obsolete now in your life. You're now being led by the Spirit of God and the law of love and liberty. And, and so Jesus now is trying to get these people to comprehend uh, that you can't connect the two. There's, there's not a, a trailer hitch to hook one to the other. It can't be done, but the problem is, is I can assure you that a lot of us have lived a lot of our lives and maybe are still living our lives trying to mix grace and law. 
and it's frustrating. I'm just telling you, if you're a Christian in here today, or you're listening to this at some point on the, on the video, and, and you just have this inner frustration that you cannot quite put your finger on, I'm telling you, check and see if you're not maybe trying to mix law and grace. Because they will not mix. They will leave you frustrated. And like I joked the other day, what you might need is a ferrisectomy <laughs> to get some of that pharisaical thinking that, that you have an ability to, to produce righteousness. Scripture clearly says that our righteousness is like filthy rags. What you and I can produce in our own flesh does not work in the economy of God. It just doesn't. And so you and I need to rest in the finished work of God. He finished the work for us. Um, and so let's go to Galatians 2. Because I love the way Paul wrote to the Galatians here. It says, do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Paul trying to get through to the Galatians who had come to Christ, were living in that, but then the Judaizers came in and convinced them that they had to add to grace, that they had to add to it workings of the law. They needed to be circumcised. They needed to go to the, or to the synagogue and all the things of the law. And so Paul was trying to relate to them, hey, listen, if, if you set aside this grace, what you're doing is saying that Christ died in vain and that you were able to do what he did for you. And, and that's what happens is, is we have to be on guard that we don't set aside the grace of God. So remember that grace is God's divine influence on our heart and it making its way through us to show in our lives. That's what the grace of God is. That's the meaning of grace. Because, see, under the law, your heart is not divinely influenced. It's law-based influence. It's on tablets of stone. And isn't it interesting that Scripture talks about a stony heart and a soft, pliable heart? And where does God deal with us but in our hearts? That's why Scripture says, guard your heart with all diligence because out of it flow the issues of life. And, and so anytime you and I start to think that part of our doing is, is you know, my story. I, my mom used to save S&H green stamps. She would go to the store and buy groceries, and she'd get five S&H green stamps, and she'd lick them and put them in her book. And then eventually what happened was she could redeem that book for a toaster or a blender or something. Well, too often in our lives, we, we, we do things, and we have this, Sad reality is like, well, God, you've seen me out there and I've been sharing your testimony and I've been giving to the orphanage and I've been doing this and this. Surely you've noticed my good works and surely, uh, you know, you could come through for me in my bank account because I'm a little short this month. That's the snare. Because scripture tells us in the new covenant we've been given all things pertaining to life and godliness through Christ Jesus that we lack no good thing, that it's already ours in Christ Jesus. And so that S&H Green Stamp book does not work. Jesus, and, and that's what happened with me, how I finally came to that place where God was able to speak the unadulterated grace of God into my life is when I came to the place and said, hey, listen, I can't do this. I can't ring the bell. My works aren't sufficient came to that reality, and the Holy Spirit was able to say to me, Bud, Jesus rang that bell for you 2,000 years ago. Go pick out your prize and tell the people how wonderful your God is. And, and it's not like it was just this big download of grace, but what it did is it made me look different going forward. I read the scriptures, and they looked different to me now. I didn't see a, a this is what I must do, but this is what he's calling me to do. Because the difference between good works and dead works is motive. Why are you doing what you're doing? Are you doing it for green stamps? Wrong motive. 
Jesus already rung the bell for you and I. Amen. But if we're doing it because his love is being poured into us, and now that love is so filling us that we start to see people as Jesus saw them, and we start to interact with people as Jesus interacted them, then now that's that flowing through us. That's us doing that works that we've been saved unto. And the amazing part is, is that in each one of us is the ability and the capability to walk out that calling. It's in you and I. You don't, you don't lack it. What you need to do is gain understanding of what it is. What is it that you've called me unto? And you know what? It might be to be just an amazing employee that shines the light of God in the business that you're working at and, and declaring the goodness of God. It might be fivefold ministry. It, it, it's everything combined is necessary for you and I to touch the marketplace, to touch the world. It wouldn't do any good if all of us were at the pulpit on Sundays and nobody was out in the world. You know, and I really found that I'd been in business for myself for 20 years, working in my shop all by myself, and I was enjoying it. I loved what I did. And God said, hey, I want you to go work for this company. So now all of a sudden I'm in a corporate setting working with a bunch of knuckleheads, and, and it's like, dang, this is a paradigm shift if there ever was one. But the amazing part is God then has worked through me in that place. Just the other day, we have a gentleman that works there, and he has major anxiety attacks to the point where they take him off in an ambulance almost. And I went back, and I prayed over him and just bound up that demon of anxiety and frustration. And, and, and at one point, he just grabbed my hand because I knew God was doing something in him. See, that, that was because God had put me in that facility. God was using me where I was at. You know, situations arise. People come and ask me about Scripture. People come and ask me about situations because they know that if you want to know something about the Bible or you want to know something about God, go talk to that guy because he knows. And, and so I'm just saying that so that you and I would, would get a hold of the fact that we have this brand new covenant and a lot of the world doesn't know and understand it. They, most of the world knows about religion. And most of the world knows that, that you know, there is a God, but he's just not happy. He's frustrated. And the law is what shines that out. And you and I now can go and say, hey, listen, let's get rid of that and function in this new one. And so next week I want to talk to us, because this, the, 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 the two cloths had more to do with, with the new interacting with the old as far as the covenants go. Next week, we're going to look at the wineskins, and the wineskins actually have more to do with you and I and the Holy Spirit and our new being. It, it will shine more light on, on us as new covenant believers and how God interacts with us and how, how the new doesn't interact with the old. And sometimes we struggle with that because we, we, we think that we're a, a sinner saved by grace. And so what we're doing is saying, hey, the law declared I was a sinner, and Jesus declared that, that, that I was saved, but I don't know how to reconcile the two. Am I still a sinner, or am I a saint? And the wineskins is, is the portion of it that, that shows forth the truth of all of that. And so next week we're going to look at that, and, and that's the one that, that really um, I think will help us a bunch. I know it helped me a ton in, in understanding um, what God did in us through this new covenant. Amen? And then, and then what I want to do after next week, and it'll probably start next week, is, is look at what the new covenant produced for you and I. What it looks like to live in this new covenant. How we live and move and have our being in Him. And then I think we're done. Amen? Father, we thank you, first of all, for the new covenant. Thank you that we were born 
under this brand new covenant. But I know that the enemy does not want us to comprehend the truth, the absolute goodness of this new covenant. He wants to confuse us and conflict us into, into trying to mix the two so that we live a life of frustration. Father, I know that he cannot take our salvation away from us but he certainly can live us, uh, um, cause us to live frustrated in our salvation. Father, my desire is that we are able to walk out of that place and truly walk in the freedom that Jesus Christ came and paid such an immense price for. And I just desire all of us to walk in the truth of how free we truly are. We're free to succeed and we're free to fail in this wonderful freedom that we don't have to fear that if we should happen to step out of the line or do something wrong that God's going to remove himself from us or back away from us, but that his grace is sufficient in all of our areas of our lives. And so I say thank you, thank you, thank you as we grow in this grace, as we grow in the knowledge of our understanding of the, our Savior, Jesus Christ, that our freedom will truly be what you've called us to walk in. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. If anybody needs prayer, come up. I'd love to pray with you. Declare what God's word says about your situation. You're the best God's got. <laughs>